Um, and then I'm and then I'm going to share my screen and we'll get started. So. All right. Can everybody see my screen here? Fantastic. Absolutely. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's meeting for uh, GOMI, the Global Organization for Wilderness Medicine. I'm just going to do a brief introduction and then we'll turn it over to our star speaker for tonight. So we are GOMI, we are the Global Organization for Wilderness Medicine Education. Our goal as an organization is to create an educational platform where interested students and healthcare professionals can explore and interact with wilderness and emergency medicine. We want to showcase the diverse spheres in which physicians and healthcare professionals can make an impact and inspire others to think abstractly about the ways in which we can utilize our careers in healthcare and medicine. And we also strive to create an international community of wilderness medicine enthusiasts and experts, and we're committed to promoting a diverse and culturally competent environment. Um, so please go ahead, scan the QR code with your phone so you can join our mailing list. With our mailing list, you will get access to our bi-weekly lectures, as well as wilderness opportunities such as fellowship showcases, certificates, certificate courses, free giveaways, and much, much more. We have a lot of exciting things planned for this spring, so make sure to scan the QR code and stay in the loop. Also, make sure to follow us on Instagram and YouTube. All of our lectures will be uploaded onto YouTube, and we will have little blurbs on Instagram before every live lecture, so you won't miss a thing. Before we get started, this is just what our schedule looks like for this spring. Today, we have Dr. Bujor Langdana here for humanitarian dentistry and austere environments. In two weeks, we'll have endurance racing with Andy Pasternak. We will have a lecture on March 14th by Dr. David Towns. He has yet to tell us what it will be about. Come back on March 26th for Survival Med, Survival um, Wilderness First Aid Certification course, and on April 9th for Obstetrics in the Wild. Our fellowship showcase will be happening in May, date to be determined. If you're really excited about the fellowship showcase, make sure you're on our email list and we'll let you know all about it. All right, now I'd like to introduce our speaker for the day. We have Dr. Langdana DDS. He is currently an NHS dentist in England. He's a professor in extreme medicine at the University of Exeter and the dental director for Team 5 Medical Foundation. He's also a faculty member of the World Extreme Medicine, RCPS Glasgow, C-O-R-O-M, R2-R-I, S-F-M-C, and editor and contributing author for the dental chapter in the Oxford Handbook of Expedition and Wilderness Medicine. He's also the founder of Wilderness Expedition Dentistry and has many years of experience in austere dentistry, having first become interested in this spe speciality while running dental camps in India and later while working in Oman, the Antarctic, Malawi, and mobile surgical services in New Zealand and with Team 5. As a reminder, we have a gear giveaway going on. I will be putting a link in the chat. If you put your name in as having attended this lecture, you will get your name entered into a drawing to win free swag donated by one of our sponsors, Pit Viper. So if you're excited about that, make sure to look in the chat for our URL. This is our executive board this year. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Langdana. If you have any questions for Dr. Langdana during the ch during the talk, feel free to drop them in the chat. We'll be monitoring the chat and making sure that he doesn't miss any of your questions. Hey, how are you guys? Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to give this presentation. Uh, and what a brilliant group of lectures coming up in future. They look really, really good and very, very practical, which is the main thing. So my talk today deals with humanitarian dentistry in austere environments. So basically, I know some of you all might not even be dentists. So this can apply also to the medical field. So let us just go and see. Let's see if the slides move. Right, we're going to move the slides. And that's it. Here we go. Uh, like, how does one get involved in the humanitarian dentistry? I was involved in humanitarian dentistry ever since I was in dental school as a student and got involved in nearly 63 dental camps there, 
And then as far as the humanitarian field goes, I was sent by the Royal College of Surgeons when I was doing my max fac surgery and taught maxillofacial surgery in Malawi as a VSO. And now, of course, I'm a Team 5 Medical Foundation, uh, which is a American Special Forces charity. So do you need any special training as a dentist or to get involved into humanitarian dentistry? I mean, you guys have to be confident of your extractions. The surgical skills is of the priority. So you have to be confident enough to push yourself outside your comfort zone, but also confident enough to know when not to push yourself outside the comfort zone. So for example, from the dental perspective, <clears throat> You could push yourself outside by doing multiple extractions if you have enough surgical expertise, confidence, and depth of experience. But then you should not embark on doing something incredibly adventurous, like trying to take surgically remove an impacted third molar. You should also be confident enough to deal with any medical or surgical complications should they arise. So Therefore, it's very important to cover or complete your basic surgical skills course. You have to know how to do good suturing. You have to know how to do a stapling in the correct way and how to do really good dressings. And that is something which your nursing staff can give you a good tutorial about. And also <clears throat> have enough lateral thinking and lateral experience to get the best disinfection and sterilization environment practically possible in that austere environment. So everything is a compromise. Now, in UK and Europe, there's a huge demand from qualified medics and students to enter into the humanitarian medical field. But there are only few posts which we can make available for this huge demand. So how can you outshine the others and make yourself noticeable? So agree going on conferences is good, but doing even a small presentation on conferences is better. And if you do go onto any deployment, it's a good idea to try in whichever journal which is possible to put in a really small publication. Also, after you've been on conferences, it's a good idea to keep in touch <clears throat> with individuals which you meet because networking is the key to this. And the best way to get yourself familiar in this environment is to teach and train and share your skills with others. That is the key. So if you are doing any teaching, what I advise all my students is keep your teaching as practical as possible, as hands-on as possible. Avoid excessive statistics, avoid giving excessive options. So you may be compromising, but at the end of the day, whoever you teach or you share or share your skills with should leave being confident and knowing and not just scared of what they're dealing with, okay? Now, for resources, you can go to the Wilderness Expedition Dentistry website. There are loads of free resources. All of them are copyright free from which you can download handouts and that will keep you within the budget of your training. So now when we go, I'll have a drink of water. When we go on, to a humanitarian deployment, what kit do we take? Now, this applies to the doctors and the medics and you also. So whenever you go on deployment, the organization will provide you a kit. But it is so important that you carry your own favorite tools with you. For me, that would apply to surgical or extraction forceps. I carry my own extraction forceps in spite of the fact that the organization provides their own extraction forceps. Also, <clears throat> you are going to work in an environment which is highly distracting, highly uncomfortable, 
and which is going to push you to the limits. So you want to make your job as easy as possible. So therefore, for the surgical sets, what I take is I take a short needle holder <clears throat> with a combined scissor, because if I'm going to do a surgical procedure in this <clears throat> sort of an environment, I don't want to hunt around for a scissor while I'm doing it. So it's better. It's much better and more convenient if it's included in the same instrument. The suturing needle, which I use, is generally 3-0 Vicryl. It is a reverse cutting needle to be used in the mouth. <clears throat> and I found the needle, which has the 3 8 of a curve, sort of in the length of between 19 to 21 millimeters, and the length of the suture, like 45 centimeters, not very long, probably the easiest to use. Why? Because your visibility in this environment is so poor and the mouth is so dark, so you need sufficient length of the suture needle that you can see clearly and manipulate easily. Again, for scalpels, I take the entire disposable blade with handle combined. You do not want to be faffing around trying to take out a blade, attach it to the metal handle in that sort of an environment. Again, you may have to make your job as easy and as convenient as possible. Now, in dentistry, we have two types of local anesthesia cartridges. The one cartridge is 1.8 ml and one cartridge is 2.2 ml. So the local anesthesia syringes which we take are the longer ones. So they can use the smaller cartridges as well as the longer cartridges because you don't want to be caught short get taking the short one and then suddenly finding a box of the long cartridges and you can't use that. The anesthesia which we use is 4% articane with 1 in 100,000 adrenaline. Why? Because 4% articane acts faster, quicker, is of a shorter duration of action and can act much better in an inflamed environment compared to 2% lignocaine. We also are prepared for any emergencies. So we take a little bit of gel foam in case, <clears throat> because the individuals who come to use may not even know their correct medical history. So therefore you could get post extraction bleeding, in which case you could pop in a little bit of gel foam and put in a horizontal mattress suture just to control that bleeding. We take a few restorative materials like cavit or glass enema. Cavit is a pre-mixed paste which sets in contact with moisture from the mouth. And glass enema is a powder and liquid mixture which you've got to mix which sticks like super glue onto the teeth. So that is what we take. We take safety glasses for the patients. <clears throat> Again, because you're working in such a distracting environment and in such a um, uh, or warmth or rain conditions. So you, you can get distracted and you can get damage to the patients. To keep our disinfection levels up, we take disposable plastic trays and non-alcohol wipes. They're the quaternary ammonium compound wipes. This is because alcohol tends to evaporate in the hot environment and will last only for a day. After that, you just have dry tissue. We take extra large, so basically gloves, which are one or two sizes larger than the gloves which you wear at work, simply because your hands will get hot and sticky and you will need a larger size gloves to put them on. Of course, mask and surgical cap. <clears throat> the surgical cap which we use is does have a little bit of a padding to stop sweat going into your eyes, but the upper aspect is really porous because if you wear the cloth cap, your head will get really, really warm. We take three pairs of head torches, two with rechargeable, one where you take your own batteries because very often you won't get access to electricity where you're going, hence you will need batteries for that. Generally, we pack this in a large waterproof bag to protect it from dust and water. And we take bungee cords because space is of a premium and you can use your walls around you to hang your instruments up. That'll all become clear in the next slides. So how do we cart all this stuff from home to the clinic? So these are transported in these huge wheelie bags. On the first day when we reach our site, 
we empty them up <clears throat> and break them into day bags. So my entire dental kit fits into this yellow backpack. The other bag which goes on my back is my grab bag. The grab bag contains all your personal items, including your passports, in case you have to evacuate that area for any safety concerns in a hurry, you have all that with you and you can evacuate straight from clinic directly to your transit point. Now, how do we transport our kit from the base camp to the clinics? So this could be really hard. You could be walking along a long, slippery, muddy surface. We could be kayaking to the local area or in the back of a very dusty 4x4 transport. So in all these areas, that is why you will, it was clear why we put our kit into waterproof bags to protect them from water, to protect them from mud, sticky mud, or from dust. So after you travel possibly an hour to two hours in any of these routes, you finally reach your clinic. And then you got to work for like approximately six hours. And after you finish your work, you got to travel back to base camp along these routes. So it, it can be a bit hard. How good, if you're a dentist, how good should your medical knowledge be? To be honest, you don't have to be that good at your medical knowledge because your colleagues who you will travel with will be the physician there. They are the people, physician or a medic or a nurse, are those type who are comfortable to work in extreme austere environments away from the safety and the investigative aids which are present in the hospitals. So they are very, very good. They are working very close to you. And therefore, if you have any problems, you can go to them and get their help. But that does not mean you do not do any prevention. Prevention is the key. So if you're suspicious of any patient, I go to my medical colleagues and ask them to assess if the patient is fit for an extraction or not. Now, the other thing which I've learned to do is that all these patients walk for like an hour to two hours to reach you. They are possibly malnourished. They haven't eaten probably. They are dehydrated. So when they come, and you are going to do a surgical procedure on them, and then they have to walk all the way back. So what I do is I give them a tablet of dextrose to chew or any glucose tablet, which pumps the sugar levels up, give them one tablet of ibuprofen. And then when they're leaving, I give them another two tablets of ibuprofen to go home with. Now you got to remember that our quantity is limited. So therefore we have to balance this out when we do this. Again, the other thing which we learned is you have to be prepared for lack of drinking water. And as in the case of Colombia, when we went, total lack of water. So that is why we don't take the powder to mix with water to give them the glucose powder. We give them chewable tablets. Finally, you've got to set up your clinic. Now, when you set up your clinic in an austere humanitarian environment, what do you need? Now, we need for the dental part of it, a nice corner, enough setup space, a good corner where you can get good breeze, good light, good space. But so does everyone else. So your team lead will decide and on one day you would have a glorious, perfect location to set up your clinic but then you'll have to compromise for the remaining six days. So everyone gets a chance to have a good location and not so good location. Now, the problem with dentistry is blood. And where there's blood, there is insects, animals, especially dogs love us. They come sniffing at our legs. Because it is open, we get a lot of dust. And corners are good for us because we have a lot of kit. So as you can see here, if it's in a corner, it has walls on the side, which is excellent for hanging your kit up. So we take our dental kit in a roll. This is a special forces roll, which we are using, which is quite expensive, but you can just get the normal carpenter's tool roll to hang your instruments 
on the sides and that saves a lot of space. Also, we need some sort of walls which will serve as a headrest. And if you're working on the patient, helps you in supporting your back because you can lean against it. Also, we need space to increase our stations. So when I start, I start off with one station, then I gradually increase it to two, three, four. So we are injecting multiple patients with local anesthesia and then doing multiple extractions. The chair which we like to use is generally the school chair. So if you're not familiar with it, it's a chair with a table attached to it so that you can put your instruments on that on the little table. It's a fixed table on it. Also, you will need two buckets, one with sand, where, you can, where the patient can spit into or where you can throw your extracted teeth into, and another with a bit of water for your disinfection sterilization purposes. And the thing you guys have to realize is that when you go to these areas, everything is at a premium. Buckets, tables, chairs, they're just not enough of them. You might be lucky to get two buckets sometimes. So this is how we set up a dental clinic. So we try to run this video. It can be a bit jerky. Just turn up your volumes because the volume is a bit low. So disinfection and hygiene. So we always learn by our mistakes. So at one deployment at the start, just to keep weight down and budget low as budget within limits, we try to get as much as we can in the country where we are deployed. So unfortunately, we, when we landed up in this country, we could not get disinfectant chemicals. We could not get surface cleaning wipes essentially we couldn't get much. So we basically used a toilet roll, um, the gels, the hand cleaning gels to clean the tabletops. And then we had to boil the instruments to get them sterilized. Now the guy who you've seen here is Eugenio. Eugenio is actually the commander in charge of an entire fleet in Peru. So what I'm trying to get to you is that there's literally no egos in the team. Everyone pulls their weight, does their work. And Eugenio was a fantastic dental assistant and an absolute pleasure to work with. He was also very good with children. So therefore, now this was at that country site. And you can see this is our sharps bin, which is a empty fizzy drink bottle. And we're using toilet rolls and gels. And this is what we graduated to. So basically what we got is disposable trays, uh, protective glasses, uh, non-alcohol wipes, um, and flattened trays where we can put our instruments in to sterilize. So we constantly learning from our mistakes and hoping to get better and better. Now the reality is of no or limited water. So basically for disinfection, what we do is we use glutaraldehyde and we put, put, put it into a bucket. Now we down the amount of liquid which we put is simply because water is at a premium. We only put it just short of our wrist level. So therefore we can put our hands into this bucket and take out the instruments. 
uh, and it prevents the disinfectant from going over the level of our gloves. So again, learning from our mistakes, we actually carry chittal forceps now, so we can easily grab hold of the instruments and take them out. Whereas in here is the bucket where the patients spit into and where we put our extracted teeth into. So we put a little bit of sand and at the end of the day, all the extracted teeth and the blood is, we dig a hole and it's buried into the ground. Now, what we noticed was that in Nepal, if this happened, we noticed that as surgeons, we often, if we see an interesting case, we get tunnel vision. And this happened with this patient. We were going to cut this patient's finger off and this was an extra digit. It was myself and the team lead. And we got so excited by it that we were like totally got scrubbed up, ready to go. And till one of our colleagues said, hey, stop it. I'm not happy with the amount and the way you prepped your surgical kit and the whole disinfection thing has to be made much better. So from that day onwards, we have one of our colleagues or one of our team members totally in charge of disinfection and sterilization. And they have the bird's eye view and have the authority to stop any procedure. Also, when I set my dental clinic up, he has a look around and he has to be happy before we can proceed. So we need a one separate person with enough skills, talents to know what to do and to set as high a level of disinfection sterilization as practically possible in that particular environment. Now, head of patient stabilization is so important. And this guy is probably the most important member of our team. He's a translator. So he basically has to hold the patient's head and control it and prevent it from moving. But imagine he has to do it approximately six hours of the day and then repeat it for the next six to seven days. And we have to look after our team member because it, in, the work is so intense that you can get burnt out. So what we do is we actually teach them how to do it and make sure that he has a pole or a wall to rest against to support his back. Now in dentistry, when you are extracting the lower right side teeth, you have to stand <coughs> behind the patient. So when you stand behind the patient, it's quite easy to support the patient's head on your stomach or your waist. Again, there's only one translator per, per station. So for the dental guys, we'll have possibly one translator. And we could have four, five stations working in that area. So if you don't have anyone helping you, you can slouch the patient down and use the back of the chair to support the patient's head or the wall to support the patient's head. So let us look at this video, which describes <coughs> head positions.
Boom. So what is a surgeon's position? <clears throat> so when we are working here, we can do the standard position, like if you see your dentist, it is standing on the right side of the patient. If you're doing an extraction of the lower tooth on the right-hand side, as I said, we stand behind the patient with the patient's head resting on our waist. But the position which I found the best working in austere environments is the astride position, is basically you're spreading your legs apart, the patient is between your legs, you have directly good vision, good support, good access, and you can turn yourself easily to pick up your instruments. If you're working on one of those school chairs, then, then you can do a semi-astride position. So one leg outside, one leg in between the patient's mouth, sorry, in between the patient's legs. And that way, again, you have pretty good access, sight and vision to do your work. Fitness. You, you have to be relatively fit, which I'm sure all of you guys are, is basically you got to travel a long distance in pretty warm or wet weather, reach the site, and then work for six hours and do some pretty nifty yogic postures to bend down to get access and to extract the teeth. Time management is also the key. Now, basically, as a dentist, I have to do a 45 to 55 extractions in one day. So you have to get your time management spot on. So how do we do that? So basically, on the first day we arrive, all the team members practice local anesthesia and get a refresher course on instruments. Now, how do we practice local anesthesia? The logic of this is that they are going to give local anesthesia in the local patient's mouths for the next six or seven days. To make this ethically and morally good, on the first day, each and every one practices local anesthesia on myself. So they actually give me a local anesthesia on the cheek side, on the roof side, and my mouth is numb through half the day. But my basis of that is A, is that when actually you push the local anesthesia in and go through the procedure, only then can you know the full proper technique of how to give local anesthesia. And the second point is, if I can trust them to give local anesthesia in my mouth, then ethically and morally, I'm okay to allow them to give in the local population's mouth and assist me in dealing with 45 odd patients on the next day, yeah? Then I train the translator. <clears throat> the translator is probably the most important member of the team. So I, get, I introduce myself to the translator. When we have breakfast, we have breakfast together. During lunch, I make sure he gets the lunch first. If anyone comes with any cold drinks or cold water, I make sure he or she gets it first. And he or she knows that they are an important member of the team because they are going to be supporting the patient's head. They are going to give, be giving the instructions before the extractions and instructions after the extractions. Next, I train their locals and our, our medical or dental students. So basically, if I want to give a preventive dental message, like a public dental health message, then I ask the locals to go through what they can explain and let them share this knowledge with the local population. So this guy was a local pastor in Colombia and he was a phenomenal guy, an incredible guy. And he was far better at communicating this message to the locals than I would be. The other thing is I teach the, the medical and dental students what to teach, give the pre and the post extractions instructions, and again, how to give the public dental health messages. So they are busy doing that while I'm preparing the next patient. Dr. Also, Ling Dr. Langdana, there's a question in the chat regarding this, um, if you don't mind. Yep, uh, shoot. 
Fatima wonders if there's continuous coordination and communication with the local community after the end of the mission so you can assess the needs, decide the supply and resourcing, and the people in the community are well informed about the services being provided. It varies. So as I said, our deployments are multiple short-term deployments. So half of them are recurring deployments where we go to the same place again. And for that, we are in close communication with the individuals concerned. They know what we are getting. We know what the follow-up is and we balance it all out. So there's a very good link between them. But some of them are one-off for various reasons or training purposes. For them, this aspect is less than desirable. But generally, our pre-deployment message goes out very clearly in the sense it's broadcasted on our radio and local communication networks and local individuals like the local at the church, which is incredibly good. While we are there, again, the message is stressed through. And generally, when we go, we teach the local dentists or the local dental therapist or the local medical therapist the different skill techniques, building up on their knowledge, and they then follow up what we do after we leave. But that is better on our recurring country visits rather than the one-off visits because we can't follow it up over a protracted period of time. Does that answer your question? Fatima? Fatima? Thank you very much for answering her question. Thank you. And the other question is? There was just a comment about um, networking is really important and it's an important opportunity to communicate about cultural competency in humanitarian missions. So less of a Absolutely. question. Absolutely. Absolutely. So right. So right. Networking is the key to everything. Okay. And the other thing is to look after yourself. So as I said, because there are uh, where we work as a dentist, there are numerous bugs in that area because the blood attracts insects. You're stationary in, a, in one area doing extractions. You get bitten excessively and dogs seems to allow love coming to that area. So generally we advise all of us to wear boots and have long trousers and not shorts because yeah, it's pretty bad. And we, that, and we spray ourselves pretty well also. Also, when you reach there, when you reach your location, it's a good idea to invest a practical amount of time to set up your dental clinic. You won't have a lot of time. You'll have like less than 15 minutes or so, but to use it wisely to decide where your dirty zone is, where your clean zone is, what your stations are, and where you can extend your station. The other thing is, to decrease the chances of your local anesthesia not working. So how do we do that? Have a slope. <clears throat> what we do is we use articaine, which I think is better than lignocaine. It is 4% acts really well. And we give a substantial amount of it. It's a 2.2 ml syringe. And we give a generous amount on the cheek side and a generous amount on the roof side. So there's less chances of it not working because if it does not work you'll have to repeat it and you will lose time again we keep a constant count on the patients who are waiting so my objective is to treat hopefully all the patients who come there requiring dental treatment so we should assess and manage literally all of them and that is why it's sometimes we might have to do less treatment on an individual patient, but at least all of them will be treated. At the end of the day, it's a compromise and it's a balance which we have to work on. We have made mistakes and we learn from our mistakes. And these slides keep getting longer and longer as we keep learning, but we keep sharing with the others what we learn from our mistakes. So taking your personal or your favorite items of instruments. So once we went on a deployment and I was told the kit would be there, but the kit which came was an American forcep kit and quite a few of the forceps were missing. Now at the end of the day, extractions is, a, is, is physics. So you could manipulate other instruments and do it, it's harder. But I learned my lesson from that day onwards, for all the deployments, I carry my own kit with me. 
using wrong local anesthesia. Initially, we used 2% lignocaine. 2% lignocaine took a longer time to act and did not work as well as articaine. Articaine is quite forgiving. Even if your landmarks for your mandibular blocks isn't perfect, if it's in the general area, articaine will still work reasonably well. Now, when we take, take our stuff in backpacks, the glove boxes used to get totally smashed up. So when we opened it, it used to be all over our kit. So now we wrap the glove boxes in transparent packaging tape. It prevents them from getting smashed up. Also, because it is quite dark where we work, often we cannot see the sizes of the gloves in different boxes and your hands are contaminated with blood. So therefore, if you want to shift a box around, you'll have to take out that glove, turn it around to check the size and again, put on more gloves, pasting your gloves. So now we take a big black marker and mark like large, extra large on all the four sides, top and bottom of the glove box so we can see exactly what they are very quickly. As I said, we used to take alcohol wipes, which evaporated on the first day. So then we are just left with tissues over the next day. So now we take non-alcohol wipes. As you saw in some of the photographs, we had to use chopping boards as our dental trays. And nowadays, of course, we learn from that and take disposable plastic trays. Head torches, we learned that you cannot get access to electricity wherever you go. So we take a battery operated and normal uh, rechargeable head torches. Sticky hands, I mentioned that you need a glove size larger than the one which you normally wear so that you can slide them in and out fairly easily. Again, to make things simple is that we take masks with loops and not the tie down mask because they're much easier to slip on and off of sensible undergarments. Now, what happens is that wherever we go, there is a security concern. So therefore, we have to be in constant sight with each other. So it's important that we that that because we have to be in constant sight with each other, we often have to change into our scrubs in the same room. So therefore, it's important to take sensible undergarments to change. Next thing is informed consent. We tell all our patients, every single one of them, that this is a difficult extraction. We will try our best. But however, if it breaks, then they may have to travel all the way down to the nearest town to, to take help or treatment from the nearest dentist. We can only do our best. Empowering medical and dental students. So basically what I noticed was once when I was assisting this particular student and I knew she was incredibly good at her work, I, knew, I noticed that her work was not up to scratch. And as it proceeded, as the procedure proceeded, I noticed that the fault was not hers. The fault was mine because as I was assisting her, I was checking what's happening around me. I was not retracting properly. I was not shining the light properly because I was trying to do too many other things. So at this conversation, I'm telling her is that if you are doing the procedure, you are the top dog, you are the primary surgeon, and you must tell us if we are not assisting properly to retract properly, shine the light properly, and you must empower them and make them confident to know that they can tell you all those things. Also, the students which we take are either medical students or dental students. They have had training in their home country, but when they come to us, we notice this is suturing. So when they came to us, we thought the new suturing, we took them to deployment. And on the first or second day, we noticed that they weren't good in suturing. So it's important to refresh the skills a day before they actually work in the clinic. So now what we do is they practice suturing at nighttime on the first or second day in artificial light so that they get used to working in the darkness of the mouth and they learn the skills of suturing. We also go through hand ties. Again, in the mouth, you don't use hand ties much, but knowing hand ties or just practicing that it improves their tactile skills. Cramps. You, you are in an environment where you're going to sweat like buckets. So therefore, we always make sure we have electrolyte solutions and we drink loads of that to prevent that from happening. 
insect bites, we spray ourselves with DEET. Backaches, you do get because that's the way it is. So often I carry a hard ball, which then I can roll onto my trigger zones and I stretch before and stretch after. We all do that just to keep ourselves functioning well for all the six to seven to 10 days of very intense clinical work. Could have done more extractions. And that is the holy grail. That is the one thing which should not happen. So we should not be relaxing and sitting when we could have done more extractions. So how do we get around that? So if a patient comes to you and says like, uh, okay, look, you look into the mouth and it's as if a bomb's exploded in the mouth. And you ask them like, so what is the problem? And then they say, all the teeth hurt. <clears throat> I said, fine, but which one is hurting more than the others? So that would narrow it down. But then they say, all the teeth hurt, okay? Then you look for signs. Are there swelling? Is there redness? Is there pus discharge? If so, then I will focus on that particular quadrant. However, if there are many decayed teeth and there are no signs like the above, then I will select that side of his mouth, which has the maximum number of decayed teeth, okay? Then I will tell him that I am gonna extract only the uppers in that on that side. There's no time to do both of them. I'm only going to do the uppers. So once I've done all the upper extractions, then I will look out and check how many patients are waiting outside. If the patients are not that many, then I'll tell him that, okay, I think we can now do the lowers also, and then do the lowers also on that side. With all the factors being equal, I'd rather extract more teeth than spend a lot of time doing one complicated extraction in his mouth. And I always under promise, but over deliver. That is, the, that is what I think is the best way to go about it. Absence of facilities. So I've often been asked this question, like what happens? You do not have any access to any x-rays. So what would be the point of that? It would make our extraction easier, but you can't tell someone who's walked for two and a half hours to reach you for an extraction, take an x-ray and say, sorry, your roots are looking really hard to get the tooth out. I won't be doing this extraction. So you have to compromise and do your best. Absence of correct forceps, as I said, is not an excuse. Either you take your own correct forceps or you compromise and do the best with what you have. If a tooth fractures on an extraction, you don't have a drill to take the tooth out, what are you going to do? So essentially that is why we tell the patients always that it's going to be hard. We can only do our best. And that is what you can do, only your best. And you have to be kind to yourself because there'll be cases which you cannot do to the level of your satisfaction and you just have to do your best. We keep fillings in our cases to the minimum because our idea is to get the patients pain-free, but there are other deployments who stay longer and do much more of that sort of work. So at the end, my job here, as I'm taken for, is essentially to extract the teeth and to get the patients pain-free. And that is what I'm taken to do, and I can't have any excuses. That is a job which I need to do. So the equipment, materials is not an excuse. You have to do it. After that, my next goal will be to support my team leaders because getting such a deployment to that location and back is an incredible logistical issue, involves incredible amount of stress on their part, and we don't want to add to their stress. But at the end of the day, I want to invest in my team members and teach them all the skills I have so we can share our skills and be a generalist in this possible location. It is a phenomenally satisfactory job to do, and I love it a bit, and I'm sure all of you guys will love it. And that is a, that will make you a better doctor, a better dentist, and a better person in your work. That's it. Thank you. And I will stop sharing my screen now. And I am ready for any questions. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. If anyone has questions, you can feel free to drop them in the chat or just raise your hand and speak it out.
I have a question for you, Dr. Langdana. How did you become interested in doing humanitarian extractions? Uh, the, the humanitarian, basically I was born and brought up in India. So there's ample scope for that. And uh, I did my paramedic training in second year of dental school. And then it's just the environment you're in. In those days, we had a road track club, which organized dental camps. So it was very easy to get onto one. There were brilliant colleagues who trained me in it, how to do it better. And the more you do, the better skills you develop. Of course, in those days, we didn't have head torches. So we are using other lighting means. And it's it, the earlier you start, you can do only little bits at the start. But as you do more and more, you develop your own skills. And it's so satisfying because working in medicine and dentistry is so toxic, so incredibly tiring, so mentally fatiguing. That it is you that is your escape. And it just makes you so much makes your general day-to-day -day work much nicer. Yeah. And I realize the benefits of that. So hence we've carried on with it. We do have a question in the chat from Fatima. She said that was really wonderful and inspiring. I would like to know if there are any upcoming missions and how we can take an active role if we are interested. Uh, you can just check on the Team 5 Medical Foundation website and put your application in. Or you can just go, there is like floating doctors who are also doing similar work, but they're longer deployments. They actually have a physical clinic where ours does have security concerns <clears throat> and you have to, and it's really, really austere environment. It's really rough environment where we go to. So it's a mixture of factors. There is a long waiting list in our case, but I think floating doctors is taking people quite readily. There are many, many organizations. These are the only two which I know. I'm pretty sure there's Mercy Ships also, which is doing something similar. Um, and yeah, there may be many more. And then a follow-up question is, how do you get funding and keep the organization um, doing the impactful work that it is doing? Incredibly good question. And basically, that is what I said. This is the logistics that is generally left to the team leads, assistant team leads, and the backup staff. So basically, just me, just for me to do the extractions in these remote environments, getting the patients pain free, but behind me, behind me using my hands and carrying my instruments to do the work, there's a huge team involved. And you don't want to add to the stress of that team. So basically, when they send you there, the last thing they want you to start complaining is, oh, but you didn't send me the right extraction instruments. So basically, that is your domain. You have to deal with that. They will get you there. They will get you safely back. They will look after you when you're there. But you have to do your job. And that is the key. And there is no excuse of that because so much time and effort has been invested in it. Some people might argue that what is, a, what is, a, what is the need for short-term deployments? I mean, if you've had a toothache, you will know that you will do anything to get rid of the toothache. And it is even, even if I get one patient free or toothache is well worth my trip going there and coming back. It is, it is very easy for us in, in our home countries to sit back and, and debate the pros and the cons and the ethical factors for short, medium or long-term deployments. But the reality of the factor is if we did not go to those areas where we go, then the patients would suffer with toothache and suffer with toothache and suffer with toothache till the tooth breaks or it gets infected and then they'll have to deal with the problems of that. They cannot go anywhere else. They have no options. Whereas we have the option, the skill and the logistical backup of going there and coming back and doing this work. And it is not just one way, it goes both way. I come back feeling refreshed, invigorated and happy and they get, uh, they get pain-free. So basically that's a mixture. So we both gain from it. It's not just one person. And then Daniel has a question. He says, have you found any local or indigenous treatments from the areas you are working in in which can be encouraged to support appropriate patient recovery in addition to or as a replacement for non-local medicines and treatment plans? That is a very good question. 
and I'm sure there is coming from India. I could contribute a lot to that. But where we go now, so basically, when we when you go on deployments, you should have aims and objectives which you can reach. You cannot have a very wide one. So our aims and objectives are to get the patients pain-free and to teach the local medical professionals and improve their skills and further improve the skills of our team members. There are other deployments which are longer, which have a different aims. And some deployments, which are not our organization, will have to work with the indigen indigenous local population to, local, to locally develop their treatment aims. But this is not ours. So you have to be realistic in your aims. And why do I say it is important to invest time and effort to train your own team members? For example, this, the, the video I showed you of Saskia setting up the clinic at that particular time, actually I was down with, I, was, I was, had a really bad bug and I was coughing and sneezing. So I had to wear a visor while working. But because I invested in the last two deployments enough time and effort in, in keeping Saskia's uh, skills up to date, she could literally run the station by herself. And it was an incredible help when I was struggling on that particular day. So that is why it's so important that everyone becomes a generalist and everyone knows each other's skills to a certain extent. And it's repeatedly reinforced. Good questions though, really nice and questions. Then for the last question for this afternoon, I was wondering if you have any favorite like stories where it's either the extraction was just like super fascinating or really great patient interactions from your travels. Uh, yeah, I do. So basically in my religion, we don't kill spiders. It's considered bad superstition. So we were in Guatemala and there was a tarantula in the other room and I was asked to kill it. And I said, I am not killing it. The next day, there was a patient with an upper wisdom tooth, which had fractured. Now there's no x-rays, so I don't know what the roots are like. So it could either be a simple extraction or it could make me sweat buckets or I could fracture the tuberosity while doing it. And again, we, I just thought and said, I mean, I, it, the patient was in excruciating pain from it. I said, I'm just going to do it. And the tooth just popped out. And I said, I was telling my colleague, if I'd killed the spider the previous day, <clears throat> that tooth would have made me sweat buckets. But the sting to the tail was that night when I was sleeping and my leg was sticking out from below the mozzie net, I actually did get bitten by a tarantula. It wasn't that bad. Apparently the bite, it's all about the hairs. If they rub their legs and drop the hairs, that stings. Well, this tarantula obviously was scared of my hairy legs and didn't do that. So I had only had two big blisters and I had an incredible podiatrist from Australia who was with us. She drained the abscesses, took betadine, pressings repeatedly changed it and it healed really well so but yeah it goes both ways <laughs> that is incredibly but, lucky to have someone from australia <laughs> exactly. there to help you with a spider bite she was that like is, oh this is, is like luck. so easy <laughs> <laughs> well thank you for answering all of our questions Yes, it's pushing up on uh, the end of our talk. So thank you everybody very much for coming to our thank humanitarian you. dentistry talk today. Um, keep an eye out for our next talk. That'll be, I believe the 26th of February. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you for having me. And thanks for attending. Thanks a lot. Cheers. <laughs>